Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Treach. I'm Nick McRae. I'm one of your associate pastors, and it is uh, a great joy uh, for me to welcome you to worship today. Uh, all of you who are in the room, of course, and also we want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online. Uh, we're so glad that you're worshiping with us. Um, if, and if you're worshiping with us for the first time, uh, we are just extra glad that you are, are here. And to that, it, whether you're new or not, uh, if you would sign in to let us know that you were here, that way we can, we can reach out to you and connect with you. If you're in the room, you'll see one of these cards somewhere in the pew around you, and you should be able to scan one of the QR codes here to, to check in and let us know you're here. There's other ways to do that. Of course, if you're online, you should be able to do that on, uh, on, the, we on the, the website. Well, friends, um, we are continuing in our worship series, as, as Amy told us in the video, in our Influencers Worship Series. And uh, this is a series where we're looking at sort of the, our great influences of the faith that have uh, helped us understand God better. And uh, today we're going to be talking about one of the most influential, I think, uh, figures in the history of, of our stream of the Christian faith, and that is Martin Luther. Um, so really excited to hear a word from Pastor Doug about that. Well, friends, if you uh, would stand where you are and greet those around you, I'm sure there's somebody who would love to hear uh, that you're happy to see them this morning. Good morning, friends. It's great to be in God's house this morning. Amen? Woohoo! Amen. We're going to sing an opening hymn. I want you to join me. It's found on page 103. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Would you sing along on our opening hymn this morning? your faith along with mine using the historic and traditional Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, 
and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. God in prayer with me this morning. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we gather here this morning to lift up your name, to lift up the name of your son and to proclaim uh, your mighty works. All that you have done through, through, through creation, through, through your redemption of your people and God, what you are doing in our world in this very room amidst us right now. God, we give you thanks and, and we praise your holy name. And God, we lift up to you this morning uh, all those places in our, in our lives, all those places in our world uh, where there is hurting and brokenness. We offer them to you, O oh God. We entrust them into your hands and we pray for your power to descend upon us now, upon our lives, upon um, all those, wherever they may be, who are hurting, who are in need of your healing touch, in need of your hope, in need of, of, um, of new life. God, we, we pray that and we trust you for that. God, we especially thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. That by his, his death, our death has died. By by his death, our sin has died. By, by entering into, into that, that darkness on our behalf, uh, we were set free in God. And, and when he rose from the grave, we rose with him. Our hearts rose with him to new life. And God, we thank you for that. And now, oh God, we, we pray to you in the words that your son Jesus taught us as we say these words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Denise Robinson from Treach. We are here at the Habitat Interfaith Build taking a little lunch break. You can see all the workers taking their lunch break, but behind me you can see the great progress that is happening in this house. The foundation has been poured, poured and prayed over. The framework is up and today it looks like roofing is being done. Today we're working on some roofing. So it was Treach's honor today to come out and serve lunch, but we also have workers from all churches and faiths working today. Thanks for your support. Did I do that right? Is that how you're supposed to do this? I don't I don't know how to do this. Did that work? Let's see if we can figure out how the real influencers did it hundreds of years ago. Good morning, good morning. How are we doing? So I just have a question. How many of us in here today are wearing a plaid shirt because of that influencer? We tease him at Jerk. He has a plaid shirt in every color, every plaid, every check. And he thinks he's really bold and like real avant-garde. And we're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you are. You are a fashion vista. Anyway, good morning again. My name is Pastor Doug, one of your associate pastors. And it's my privilege. It's just an amazing privilege to be able to have the responsibility to stand up in front of you all and share uh, stories about influencers. Have you been influenced lately? Think about your week. Did somebody appeal to your eye, to your ear, to your intellect, to your heart to think or act differently? That's how I like to think about influencers. Did you see something, hear something, feel something? Did someone entice you with word or visual or perhaps aroma to think or act differently? Look at the person next to you and say, did you? All right, y'all go ahead. Couples, y'all just talk it out. <laughs> we do every day. It's called marketing in some regard. It's called sharing. It's called storytelling. It's called witnessing. In all sorts of arenas in our world today, we are being influenced. Hopefully, as people of faith, we have been and continue to be influenced by Scripture, by uh, the witness that we get from other people, right? So today, man, I've got a really fascinating character. And character is an understatement for Martin Luther. I don't know. Do we have any history nerds in the house? How about if I just took off the word nerd? Do we have history, <laughs> history buffs? He almost single-handedly was the spark that created the Protestant Reformation, which uh, pretty much changed the world. In, in, the, uh, in regards to many, many things, education and Christianity, so forth and so on. So he was uh, German-born, early 1500s, uh, kind of a stoutly guy. You know, it's kind of a tradition that pastors sometimes are, are stoutly. Some of us are trying to uphold that tradition. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he was a monk. He didn't always want to be a monk. At one point in his life, he wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, there is a story, I don't know if it's a, story, if it's a fable, but it is in the books, that he had already started law school and was traversing one day. That's old, old-timey word for walking. He was traversing through the meadow, and a huge storm came upon him, so much so that he made a, what we would call a, uh, a deal with God. God, if you get me through this, I will change my career path and become a pastor. Now, I don't know about how many pastors were motivated, you know, in their call story about, I made a deal with God. God, help me survive, and I'll go be a pastor. But that, that was his story. So he, he changed the course of his life, went to seminary. He was, 
probably a pretty blessed guy in that, in that day and time, not everybody had access to uh, education. Not everybody had access to academy. Not everyone had parents who upheld that. But his parents pushed him, pushed him, pushed him, and I'm sure God continued to say, come on, come on, come on. So here's a couple of things, though, that are really important that begin to set the, his trajectory off. He uh, was very robust in his thinking and in his challenging of the Catholic Church with a capital C. Back in that day and time, you didn't poke the bear, so to speak. You didn't point out their faults. And he not only did it, but he did it robustly and vigorously. And to his aid, another very important, and I cannot understate how important one other invention was almost at the very same time he came on the picture. Anybody know what it was? Printing press. The printing press. The printing press then is what, unfortunately, Twitter is to politicians today. It got their word out quickly, not like the, the Twitter does today, but it enabled them to have their words printed and uh, widely distributed. Before that, all you could do is stand on a corner or stand in a pulpit and preach, and you had somewhat limited audience and, you know, so forth and so on. He was a big believer that the word, Scripture, was the ultimate authority and that it had to be spoken in what he called the common man's language, which was at that day and time what they also called common German. Not, I guess, highbrow German, but common German, which is what the majority of the people spoke in all of the settings where he found himself. Um, he was so uh, agitated by the acts of the church that he went about challenging them. And one of the things you maybe have heard is this, this phrase. He wrote 95 Theses. Have you heard that? 95 Theses. It's kind of like you or I getting assigned 95 term papers, 95 projects that we sat down and poured our heart into. And uh, the way in that time that you would alert the authorities, whether it was your local church pastor or the government or whatever, that you had a bone to pick with them was you would go and hammer those uh, essays or feelings to the front door of wherever they were. Well, so, you know, it wasn't necessarily uncommon in the marketplace, but it was never heard of that you would challenge the authority of the church. So the very fact that he took all 95 of those, a hammer and a nail, and he went to the front door of the church and literally accosted the church door with that. We are very grateful here at Treats that we now have uh, mail and the Internet. If you would like to accost us with any strong feelings, please do not come and hammer things in the door of the church, okay? You can drop in the mail. You can uh, send it Karen Kraska at TMUMC. <laughs> she will give you the sweetest response of anyone. Um, so he's about doing that. He uh, had a buddy who ran the shop with a printing press. All of these theses began to be published and distributed. And the word in history books is that within two weeks, multiples of thousands of copies had been printed and they were distributed far and wide throughout Germany, France, and all the way, imagine this back then, all the way to England. So I would say pretty confidently the word was out, wouldn't you? So that's going on. And in the meantime, he felt so strongly about the word scripture being available to the common people that he, having been wise, you know, pretty wisely educated, spoke Latin and was able to translate the Bible, the New Testament, from Latin to German, from Latin to German. And this is another really critical piece in the evolving story because, um, A, hardly nobody spoke Latin. You might have a pastor or another highly education, educated person who spoke Latin. Also, uh, scriptures were not widely available. I read one history book where it said that if a church had scripture, it was not uncommon for the whole Bible to be chained to the pulpit. <laughs> a little radical, isn't it? But it was also very rare that individuals would have them. So who had Bibles then? rich people, and pastors in big churches. And that was it. And they were in Latin. And so work with me here. So Martin Luther is beginning to get agitated with the powers of be behind 
the big church, because they not only had power, but they had power over the people because they could read the book and tell you what's in it. Did you catch that? They would be the sole interpreters of Scripture and say, hey, church, y'all just trust me. I read it. You don't need to read it. I can tell you what it says. My friends, be very weary if a pastor ever says to you, do not read it. I can read it and tell you what it says, okay? Martin Luther was a big, big believer. He said, a simple layman needs to be armed with Scripture, and in doing so, he was superior to both the Pope and his council. He said a lot of things that began to get under the skin of the Catholic Church. One of the things that was his really big kind of bone to pick was that the church was selling what's called, what was called indulgences. Have you all heard that phrase? Uh, I, don't, I don't think they do it anymore. I hope they don't. But an indulgence was actually a framed certificate that you could buy um, in which you were given a sheet of paper that said, we the church will pray for your loved one who has passed and we will pray them from purgatory, and we will guarantee you that they are now in heaven. Imagine how um, comforting, perhaps, that was to a family who wasn't real sure how things turned out for Grandpa, (laughs) or Uncle Joe, or Uncle Luther, or Uncle whoever. Imagine who, though, bought the majority of those people who couldn't afford it. Luther is quoted to have said, why, imagine him pounding the stone, the pulpit, why does not the Pope, whose wealth is greater than the wealth of all of us, build the Basilica of St. Peter with his own money rather than the money of poor believers? Ooh, how do you think that landed on the headquarters ears? What I can tell you is not good. He was given numerous opportunities to recant, and you can imagine what he'd say. Nope. He was given numerous times to come and appear and to testify and to rechange and to rewrite the article. Nope, 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 not going to do it. A bounty was put on his head. He was uh, found without even appearing in court to be a heretic. He was going to be uh, executed. But wiser thinkers prevailed in that they were like, Hey, you know that guy that is now widely published and his papers are everywhere? It probably would not benefit our cause very much if we did him in. So he was allowed to uh, survive, um, but continued to uh, preach and teach and speak in a way that uh, pretty much ultimately got him uh, cast out and was never, you know, he was never the guest at Thanksgiving dinner at, uh, at the Pope's house. So, in the midst of all that, though, he was also an ordinary person wrestling with what it meant to be a person of faith. He came out of a tradition where one earned their forgiveness by their deeds. One earned their forgiveness by having your pastor pray you through and pray forgiveness for you. And he said, that isn't right. I'm going to read you a quote. It's kind of long, but listen, listen to his angst. He says, at last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which, is that through which the righteous love live by a gift of God, namely by faith. By a gift of God. Where else have we heard that? Where else might he have heard that? Well, I'll tell you. Turn with me to Ephesians, the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2. And I think, I'm not sure that what I'm going to say matches with what they have on the screen. So it's my fault, not their fault. So, listen now. If you have your Bible, turn with me. If you don't, just uh, listen up. This is Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of that great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we hear your word and with uh, caution. We open our hearts to hear it, to challenge our living. In your name, amen. You know, we um, in Methodist Church, most Christian churches, are great influencers of grace. You've probably heard that word a gazillion times. Grace, God's grace, God's grace for everybody. God's grace, God's grace, God's grace. Um, I want to spend the next part of my sermon inviting you to wrestle with me that we like it more than we live it. Could it be that we are um, anxious recipients? Who doesn't love being extended grace, right? But then are we, in turn, extending it to others? So where Martin Luther found himself, and I think we find ourselves today, is this conflicting place of two worlds. There is the world of God's grace. God's grace, another phrase for that is uh, unmerited love, unmerited um, favor, that you or I did nothing to, quote, earn or deserve this other than to be born into this world as beloved children of God, okay? That's one concept. The other concept is that, well, you have to earn God's grace. You got to... be really good, and when you're not, confess, and repent, and try again, and do a lot of really good stuff for a lot of people. So Martin Luther was espousing what Paul was saying in that grace via Scripture is a free gift. It's a free gift. In a minute, we're going to talk about the uh, challenges that come with that. But you can see where that conflicted with those who are like, no, you can't just be willy-nilly giving out grace. People are going to take advantage of that. People are going to run muck. They're going to be crazy. We, I believe, in the Western culture are very much, uh, we're kind of a scorekeeper, scorekeeper people, aren't we? We like it when people earn our love and grace and forgiveness. We like it when they do good things, and it makes it a whole lot easier to keep loving them and forgive them if they have continued to build up a bank of good deeds and good actions. It's really hard to love somebody just at face value if I say, yeah, this person over here, they haven't really done diddly squat, but they're a beloved child of God, and, well, you and I need to extend grace to them. That's hard, isn't it? That's really hard. It gets even harder because no one is excluded from that And no one is excluded from God's expectation of us as recipients of God's grace to now model God's grace. I don't know about you, but I got a list of some people that are very questionable. (laughs) How about you? Look to the person to your right and left and go, I don't know about you. I don't know. I don't know. Don't we live like that really, though? It's hard. It's hard today. It's hard this morning. What am I supposed to do with the crazy guy that went in a grocery store and shot up a lot of people in Buffalo? What does grace mean in my living of my life with people who do horrible, no good, very bad things? Here's what I figure. Grace says that I see in them God, that they are beloved child of God, but their actions are not excluded from accountability and responsibility. Does that make sense? That I can love them, and sometimes it's really hard to love horrible people. Even then, are they horrible people or did they do horrible things? Sometimes it feels like they're horrible people. I'll be honest with you, doesn't it? Because it's just atrocities that are beyond comprehension for most of us. That doesn't exclude that person, though, I believe. You You can disagree with me from being, A, a beloved child of God, 
and a worthy recipient of God's grace. And therein is the rub of living our faith. It's hard. Grace is hard. I had a great conversation with a uh, church member after the uh, 9.30 service. She goes, okay, Pastor Doug, that was really good, but I got questions. I said, okay, bring them. And she said, um, wherein does accountability and responsibility come with grace? And I said, well, I think it's a, it has to be a partner to it. It doesn't mean I don't love my kid any less when I ground them or when I point out their unhealthy or bad behavior, does it? It Does it change that inner love I have for my child? No. I still love them. Matter of fact, in part, my need for them to live better and differently is rooted in that what? That love. Can we even begin to comprehend the love God has for us and uh, the desire God has for us to live into accountability in our world. So uh, at the Meyer House recently, we, uh, we made a choice. It was a hard choice. And uh, we got a puppy. He's a really cute puppy. But he's a puppy. And he's a stinker. And he chews and bites and poops everywhere. I'm just telling you all. And, uh, but I love him. But every now and then, he, I just want to send him back. <laughs> and every now and then, I'm like, I can't even begin to imagine the love I have for him and holding him accountable with a swift swat on the nose or scruff of the neck or the butt. And, um, and I did all that because I wanted a puppy and I love puppies. But ooh, sometimes we make choices, y'all, out of our love for others that then really complicate enforcing accountability, don't we? I'm sure you love your family more than I love my puppy. I don't know. I love my puppy a lot. His name's Augie, and uh, he'll be on tour sooner or later, but he's... uh, (laughs) When is it that we fail at extending grace? Can we just be honest here for a minute? Is it when we have been wounded? Is it when we perceive that an action or a word has been said to us that seems unrepairable? Anybody had a moment like that? I think it is on us to do the work to identify the wound and to ask for God's help to heal it. I think it is on us to identify the wound and to lay vulnerable to God God's work in helping us heal that. I really do. Um, what would, it be, what would it be like if today we prayed, God, help me, and then fill in the blank with the person's name, help me forgive, release, remove the pain that person has inflicted on me and extend to them the honor of calling them a beloved child of God? Who might that help the most, them or you? Chances are they don't even have a clue, Right? They've gone on with life. I believe it will align our spirit more closely to that which God is desiring for us. Does it help you or me at all to carry around that that hurt, that pain, that resentment, whatever it is, that is is a barrier between extending grace to that person or institution or what have you that did a horrible, no good, very bad thing to you? I think, friends, and I'll close with this, that we have a responsibility as people of faith who witness, influence others to be growing in our faith to take care of our own house, to uh, open our soul to God's healing touch, to name those places where we are holding tight to those ways that God has asked us to let loose to offer love, to offer mercy, to offer forgiveness. Hear me that I don't believe that that comes free of responsibility and accountability. Okay? I think that's the conundrum in our world today. We lean more into punishment 
than into grace. I don't know. Don't let me lose it. I pray for you, as I pray for me, that we allow God to access those most wounded places in our lives and to begin the healing process of naming those and living more fully into a, uh, a person who has received the most amazing gift in the whole world, God's grace. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, uh, goodness, we hear your word, we study it, we read it, we try to understand it, we listen to what other people have said about it, and every now and then we come upon these uh, potholes, and we find that in those we have buried away things that we don't want to let go of. God, help us to unearth that stuff, to pull it up, to look at it, to release it, to ask you for help and healing. All the while, we confess, God, that we have probably inflicted, inflicted pain in others as well. For that, oh God, we ask for forgiveness. In your name we pray. Amen. So, friends, as always, man, thank you all. For all you do. You know, here we are. Aren't you glad um, that you, we, us, being the generous congregation that we are, uh, that we have air conditioning? <laughs> Did you know that in part, your, your tithes and offerings pay for basic stuff like electricity? And electricity gets translated into what? Air conditioning. Thank you, Jesus, for air conditioning. No, seriously. All the different ways that you give, all the different ways that you serve, all the different things that you do, are making a difference here at Treach and in the greater Louisville Flower Mound community. And for that, I simply say thanks.
you, friends. That was written by Martin Luther. He wasn't really known as a hymn writer. He did write a few hymns, several of which are in our hymnal, but other than that one, you've probably never heard of them. So <laughs> he was a wonderful theologian and did contribute so much to our Christian uh, faith. Would you stand as you're able, and we're going to sing about grace, grace that overcomes and is greater than all our sin. Our hymn is found on page 365. Would you join as we sing? <laughs> Y'all were great today. <laughs> Weren't they? Can y'all do that Martin Luther piece in German, though? That'd be great if y'all could just... All right, so um, y'all are getting out early. Did you see that? Yeah, they said. Okay, but so uh, in exchange for getting out early, I'm going to give you some homework. I know, I know. Y'all can handle it. So if you are inclined, and, and you're one of those who uh, goes to the Tree app. So I, I wrote some questions for what we call the huddle guide, which is uh, breakout groups that we have before church where people kind of begin getting their mind around the sermon and all that. And I'm pretty impressed with some of the questions I wrote. Uh, apparently, I should have worked these into the sermon. But um, 
Here's the one I want you to think about today as you go eat lunch, okay? How does receiving God's grace influence your behavior with others? Can you do that? How does receiving God's grace influence your behavior with others? All right. Secondly, I'm supposed to remind you that uh, there were two meetings this morning when Pastor Daniel helped explain what's going on in the United Methodist Church and how that intersects with uh, the life of uh, our vital church here at Tree. There's another one tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in the ministry center, right? We hope you'll come and be a part of that. And then uh, lastly, uh, today at 4 o'clock, there is an all-church picnic. Back when we were planning it, we thought, you know, wonder what will be the hottest day of the spring. <laughs> what do y'all think? Let's do it on that day. That's the great day for a picnic. And thank you, Jesus, for air conditioning. So most of the outside activities have been moved inside the Family Life Center, which has air conditioning. The only thing that's going to be outside is a fun concert that'll be on the front lawn under the shade. Uh, you're just going to need something to bring, bring something to sit on beside your bottom. Uh, folding chair, blanket, pillow, something like that, okay? So all that said, my challenge to you and the challenge to me today is how do we go out and live as grace-filled people in a world that's hard and hurting? How do we do that? Let's do it. What do you say? Let's go in the world and make a difference for Jesus the Christ. Amen? Amen. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.